Hello, I'm Marvin Natovich. I'm staff here at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm pleased to be hosting today a discussion with Dr. Tim Bowie of the Massachusetts General Hospital on gastrointestinal issues in children with autism spectrum disorders. Dr. Bowie is a distinguished pediatric gastroenterologist and is currently clinical director of gastroenterology and nutrition at the Lurie Center for Autism based at the Massachusetts General Hospital for Children and is faculty in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. The learning objectives for today's webinar are several. First, to discuss the spectrum and prevalence of GI and nutritional issues in children with autism. Second, to discuss the diagnostic recognition of these issues. Third, to discuss clinical practice guidelines for the evaluation and care of GI issues in children with autism. And finally, Dr. Bui will present his ideas about major clinical research needs in this field. To begin with, Dr. Bui, um, there's a considerable literature regarding GI issues in children with autism. Can you tell us a bit about what types of GI issues occur in children with autism and what does the best evidence say about the frequency of occurrence of different types of GI issues in this patient population? As you know, uh, autism's been discussed really for less than 100 years as a medical diagnosis. And the medical literature talking about how these children present with, with medical problems is really very short in, in historical terms. The literature really starts looking at the possibility of gastrointestinal problems only in the late 90s. And so we've really only got about 15 years worth of a literature that talks about the prevalence of gastrointestinal problems in this community. We, we reported in a consensus report back in 2010 in pediatrics that the frequency of gastrointestinal problems in children with autism seems to be higher than the general pediatric community and that the prevalence is somewhere in the range of 40 to 70 percent. Um, that's pretty high and it's a good deal higher than the general pediatric population. Recently, in fact in May of 2014, there was a paper that tried to do a meta-analysis of all of the published literature looking at gastrointestinal conditions in autism. What they vetted were about 15 papers that had the literature to suggest uh, a control population and a patient population of kids with autism. And they likewise found what we reported, which is that there's a very high frequency of children with autism who have gastrointestinal problems, probably in the range of 50 to 70 percent. And based on the best data, which of the major types of gastroenterological issues seem to occur most commonly in persons with autism and which seem to occur disproportionately the most in persons with autism? I think those are questions that are not completely answered by the literature so far, but as we can judge, the papers that have been published so far talk about a, a, a general presentation of medical conditions that aren't too different than the general pediatric population, but they may be more common in this group of kids. So common medical conditions like constipation, diarrhea, acid reflux, food allergy are the conditions that come up again and again and again in this population. We do not find that there's evidence for a distinct gastrointestinal condition in autism, such as autistic enterocolitis or some inflammatory state that is unique to children with autism. And I think that's extremely important because it, that, that hunt for something different about these children may not be where it's at. The hunt for the underlying medical condition may be where it's at. And parallel to talking about major gastroenterological issues, I'd also like to ask you to give your input on what are the major nutritional issues that are known or seem to occur more commonly in persons with autism? Some large studies that have looked at the nutritional impact of these dietary restrictions haven't really shown that there's a large-scale deficiency in the patient population of children with autism. So although they may be taking a diet that's relatively limited in fruits or vegetables, they don't seem to have a high frequency of vitamin C deficiency or other particular nutrient deficiencies. I think the risk deficiencies that have been reported very commonly include vitamin D deficiency, 
calcium deficiency, um, and perhaps vitamin C deficiency or particular deficiencies when kids are very, very selective away from food groups. And what are your thoughts, Dr. Bowie, based on your years of experience and expertise in the field, in terms of um, what you feel are the major limitations on the studies published to date regarding the frequencies of different gastroenterological and nutritional issues in persons with autism? I think one of the biggest difficulties with evaluating children with autism and looking at underlying conditions is that under every other circumstance, we have a group of individuals who can tell us what's wrong with them. And so we've got people who can come up to us and say, doctor, I'm having pain here. Or doctor, I'm finding it difficult to swallow. Or this food feels funny in my mouth and that's why I don't want to eat it. But so many of the presentations of children with autism are behaviors that seem to result from that potential sensitivity. And we can't get to that through questionnaires. And, and most of the difficulty that I see is that the questionnaires that have been put forward to try to ascertain gastrointestinal problems are, are very limited. And when we look at the, the databases and the, and the medical reports that are out there, they're based on very limited questionnaires. A couple of the questionnaires out there are simply, do you perceive your child to have constipation? And if the parent clicks yes, then that patient meets the criterion for constipation. So I think that part of it is, is how do we ascertain those answers from these children who are often nonverbal or have significant communication defects? And how do we expect parents to be able to answer those questions for their nonverbal child? Um, and are we asking the right questions? And in taking the history, the gastroenterological history of a child with autism, what are the key issues that you try to question about? We're very focused on, um, on eating behaviors and in intake behaviors, uh, in, in particular with regard to nutrition. We're very focused historically on how children presented in the past. And so one of the things that I think is extremely important and maybe informative about if a child might have a persistent food sensitivity is if they had previous food sensitivity issues. Did that child have formula intolerances or colic or irritability in infancy that may have represented a food allergy or sensitivity that wasn't picked up on at that time? Or did they require multiple formula changes and have to go through that process? Us. Um, some of those problems in retrospect might have been a child who had sensory processing issues and may have been showing their early neurological manifestations of autism, but some of them may be the presentation of gastrointestinal distress that we just weren't able to recognize at that time. We're very focused on uh, the, the, the grazing patterns of children. So can they sit down and eat a regular meal or do they need to gradually eat over the course of the day uh, for comforting purposes or the like? That may be a really nice marker for the child who has distress and discomfort between meals and that that grazing behavior might represent acid reflux, for instance. We're very interested in trying to characterize the stool pattern as best we can. What's the frequency? What's the pattern? How comfortable is the child when the child is going? All of those, I think, are informative. And perhaps maybe one of the best examples of, of how we misinterpret data is we see many children who have problems like frequent small stools per day six, seven, ten stools per day where they're going into the bathroom and they're having production of stool but they're not really having a, a successful event and so those kids are going with a frequency that would make you consider that they would have diarrhea or that they are certainly not constipated when in fact they're having difficulty evacuating and treating them for constipation might be a very successful pathway for them. So I think all of that really getting down closely to the patterns has been very helpful for us to sort through how we're going to treat those kids. And in addition to the questions you ask about their gastroenterological history, the gastrointestinal <coughs> history, um, are there any additional questions that you really uh, uh, feel strongly about getting and history taking regarding the nutritional history? Um, I think it's important, especially as you're tracking 
uh, growth and development that you need to know how those kids have grown over time and and having access to what their growth charts looks like is extremely helpful because there are kids on both sides of that spectrum very thin kids who can't put weight on who the parent would report is eating fairly well but doesn't look good on the growth chart and we've got kids who are excessively uh, 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 overweight in fact and are really in trouble because of medication side effects or the like and so we're very focused focused on what their growth chart looks like and how they're doing from that perspective. I think we're very interested in what, what their sleep history might be as they present and sleep disturbance might be a, a hallmark of gastrointestinal problems or nutrient deficiencies. For instance, rest, less, restless legs or sleep disorder is, an off, is a, a common marker for iron deficiency and in kids who may be selective or kids who may be over intakers of milk, they may have a higher frequency of, of, of iron deficiency and we can help rectify some of their sleep disorders by recognizing their deficiencies. That's very interesting. Um, persons, uh, Dr. Bowie, with, with autism by definition have um, communication deficits and it can be more um, difficult uh, to detect symptoms such as abdominal pain and it would seem that uh, behavioral indicators sometimes can be the sole indicators of pain. Could you um, discuss for us some uh, vocal behaviors that might be markers of abdominal pain or discomfort in children with autism? Uh, I think that there are several vocal uh, presentations that kids may have, and uh, one of them is, is throat clearing behaviors. Uh, that's often interpreted as a tick uh, and, and ticks have been described in children with autism as a neurological dysfunction. But often that throat clearing or guttural vocalization is an, is an early marker for gastroesophageal reflux. And we have to remember that gastroesophageal reflux in infants presents with spitting up. And many of these kids have spitting in their early months, but they don't continue to spit up. And so the majority of kids who have acid reflux symptoms over a year won't give you the marker of vomiting. They're going to give it in some other way. They're going to have frequent ear infections. They're going to have vocalizations or throat clearing. Sometimes this, uh, this habit cough that people talk about on the pulmonary side may be a presentation of, of acid reflux where kids are trying to clear their esophagus or they've got low-grade irritation. Difficulty swallowing sets off uh, sometimes the, the, the throat clearing behavior. So things like eosinophilic esophagitis or allergic esophagitis can often set off some of these vocalization issues. I see. And what about motor behaviors? Are there specific motor behaviors that could be markers of abdominal pain or Absolutely. discomfort in someone with autism? I think the hallmark motor behavior that kids have is, is pressure-seeking behavior on the belly. So if I see a child who's leaning over the furniture and leaning on the arm of a chair, or I have a child who's on the yoga ball and is constantly seeking that belly pressure or is asking mom or dad to give them deep pressure that we've always connected to the sensory processing issues of children with autism, they're very often asking you to look there. One of the behaviors that I think uh, is often missed is pointing behaviors. We talk about autism as a condition where children don't know how to point early on. In fact, that's one of the hallmark markers that children may not be able to localize. But once they can, and once they point, they very often do when they've got a problem, but we don't recognize it. So these are children who often develop a tapping behavior on something that's bugging them. And we'll very often see in the office a child sitting there tapping on their chest or tapping on their belly, and the parent doesn't recognize that as all as a pain presentation or a complaint, but they've been asking that child to point for all of their uh, academic training and support, uh, and here they're doing it, and they're not responding to it. Um, I think the other common behavior that we're really focused on is posturing type behavior. So if children are taking funny postures with their neck or torsing their body, often that's a marker that they're trying to do something with their physical posture to help gain comfort. And those children were very interested in doing uh, a medical workup. And are you familiar either from the medical literature or from your own clinical practice, certain behaviors such as self-injurious behaviors or aggressive behaviors towards others that could that are motor behaviors that are sometimes clues to an underlying GI pathology? Yes. I think that that's a really important question and I think maybe this is the most important topic of this short discussion. 
the problem behavior or what we call um, subtle, unexplained, repetitive behaviors are common behaviors that are set off by some underlying medical issue. And yet, we let children with autism have these behaviors because they're autistic. That's really a very wrong position to take. There's very good data that's come out of the Autism Treatment Network that's now published, and it's been published in the work that we did in our consensus paper as well, with children who have aggressive and, 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 and self-injurious type behaviors, that that has a very high correlate to gastrointestinal problems. And the two highest correlations of problem behaviors in children with autism is nonverbalness. So, if a child is unable to vocalize what's going on with them, they may have more problem behaviors or aggressive behaviors and gastrointestinal issues underlying them. And, and so, when you see those problem behaviors occurring, especially if they're new onset or there's a change in the character of those behaviors, that ought to be the first clue that you take to consider an underlying medical condition. It's not always gastrointestinal. It could be teeth pain. It could be migraine. It could be ear infection. It could be strep. It could be a variety of underlying medical conditions. But that change in the, in the nature of problem behavior is a very good marker for an underlying medical condition. And uh, a short while ago, you mentioned restless legs during sleep. Are there other sleep disturbances that can sometimes be a clue to important underlying GI pathology? Yes, and I think they look like a lot of other things. And so, for instance, we've got a lot of children who won't sleep in a flat position. They're trying to find a place that they can comfortably sleep. And so, when a child is sleeping in an upright position or sleeping on a play toy or something else like that, I think that should be a red flag to consider an underlying GI condition. The child who takes a long time to go to sleep may have a lot of reasons for that. And when you do sleep hygiene questionnaires, you may find that we need to calm down the evening before that or other things. But if you've addressed all of those sleep hygiene issues and they still have problem with sleep induction, we really would look at underlying medical issues. Most importantly, I think the child who goes to sleep fairly well but has reawakening in the middle of the night, we're very concerned about those kids as having a manifestation of acid reflux. And certainly that's one of the, the presentations of, of reawakening. And that child may not reawaken unhappy or unhappy comfortable, the reflux may be simply increasing the arousal state so those children wake earlier than they should. And so, they don't have to wake crying to think about reflux. They have to wake frequently. And, and I think those are things that would make us at least consider whether there's underlying GI issues there. And in the medical literature or in your personal medical experience, if you treat persons who have such sleep disturbances as a reawakening or multiple reawakenings, with anti-reflux medication, does the sleep pattern improve? Oh, absolutely. I, I think it, uh, sleep disorders in children with autism are multifactorial, and so they may need other help. But often, added acid reflux, acid reflux treatments are, are quite helpful for that. And then a subset of children along the autism spectrum have uh, unusually or highly selective diets. Why do you think that might be? It's a wonderful question. And I think that there are a whole bunch of considerations. Uh, certainly, the need for sameness is a core feature of autism. And so, there are children who I think become highly selective about the type of foods that they're going to take in because they become comfortable with those foods. And, and, and yet, there are probably other factors involved as well. Some children become really focused on taking in foods into their mouth that they can feel well. So, it, they may be more likely to migrate to hard and crunchy foods because it gives them enough sensory input to their mouth that they know how to manage that and handle it and swallow it down. And so, it may be a sensory component in some of those kids. It may be a preference component in some of those kids. M many children, though, who have problems with food allergy or sensitivities to foods may find something from a tactile perspective when they put that food in their mouth that creates an aversive event for them. And so, some of those uh, food aversions or food restrictions may be earned fairly by their food sensitivity. And we need to at least recognize that before we try to completely re-indoctrinate those kids through behavioral feeding programs to put those foods back in.
And some of my feeding friends have actually shown that as they use behavioral approaches to get those kids to put foods back in, they've seen them start to break out in hives and show evidence of food allergy that those children probably knew they were going to have and were trying to self-restrict. I think it's a very interesting topic, and I, I, I think it requires thinking that through with every individual kid and every particular circumstance uh, to get to that. And what are the possible consequences of uh, very highly restricted diets, and how and when should a pediatrician or a gastroenterologist monitor for such possible consequences? I think that the risk is that there could be a nutrient limitation. And that's when the child is self-restricting or when parents have chosen to do a restrictive diet out of concern that there may be food triggers. And so very commonly now, children are placed on diets that are milk-restricted diets or milk and gluten-restricted diets. One thing that's important to keep in mind is that those foods are often enriched with nutrient supports. And so when we put on a child on a gluten-free diet or whether he puts himself on that diet, or uh, we're taking away a lot of the enriched products that these children are getting, which is their primary source of B vitamins. And so we may need to be at least aware of the fact that we're restricting them or they're the restricting themselves from sources. Kids who are putting themselves on a milk-restricted diet are certainly losing their primary source of calcium and vitamin D, and we need to at least be aware that they need to find other ways to get those products in. It's interesting, uh, the Autism Treatment Network has, has reported their data on the, these kids who have food restrictiveness, and even when they're fairly restrictive and they've done these dietary assessments, they don't find that they're, they're deficient in the, the vast majority of these settings. And so I, it's an amazing thing that most kids meet their needs even when they're pretty restrictive. And tell us, does celiac disease or gluten intolerance occur more commonly in persons with autism? And is there documented benefit of a gluten-free or gluten and casein-free diet in some persons with autism? So let me handle the first question first, and that is, is there a higher frequency of gluten sensitivity or, glu or celiac disease in autism? The answer, as best we can answer it based on some of the population studies, is that there is no higher frequency of celiac disease in autism now. A very large population-based study that came out of Sweden uh, last year in 2013 really reported very cleanly that there's no higher prevalence uh, of celiac in this population. But we have to consider... Based on serologies or based on biopsy? Uh, based on serologies. Uh, what, what is important is that these are now two relatively common conditions that can coincide. So the prevalence of celiac disease is one in 130 individuals. That's pretty high. And the prevalence of autism now uh, is reported at one in 68 uh, children. And so the coincidence of those conditions are, are not uh, un unmeasurable. We have a number of kids who have both of those conditions. Maybe the bigger question that families ask is, is the gluten sensitivity uh, a factor that's accounting for my child's autism? And is it a value for me to take gluten out because it's affecting the autism? That remains an open question, but the studies that have been performed so far looking at milk-free and gluten-free diets in broad-based children with autism, unselected for their sensitivity issues, uh, have not shown a benefit to instituting a casein-free, gluten-free diet. I would contend that the major limitation of those studies is that they took all comers. And why I should expect that a casein-free, gluten-free diet will treat autism uh, any better than putting a child with autism on Risperdone and thinking his autism will get better on a medicine or some other uh, uh, agent is, is probably faulty pathway. We know that autism presents in a whole host of ways. There are probably many underlying phenomenon in different subgroups of kids. And so I think a better way of thinking about diet in autism is that there may well be a subgroup of children who have autism, who've shown problems with food sensitivity, who might be wonderful candidates to place on dietary restriction programs to see if they may have improvements in their well-being. And I, I think that's the better pathway to look forward to, that there will be a unique subgroup that might benefit from those interventions. And Tell us what symptoms or signs might turn up uh, in a routine physical examination of a child with autism by a pediatrician or a family practice physician that might warrant referral to a pediatric gastroenterologist. 
I think most of the children that I see have pretty normal physical examinations. And so um, the, the normal physical uh, exam, I think, shouldn't exclude the consideration of this. Most of the kids who come to see us in the gastrointestinal clinic are coming because of historical s symptoms that they're presenting with that aren't easily explained in other, way, in, in other ways. Uh, a, a number of the children that we see do have some common characteristics. And so we see very frequently eczema, and other skin manifestations that may mark allergy tendencies, and that might raise our consideration uh, to do work up in that arena. Um, I, uh, obviously, the child who is uh, doing self-injury and, and those kind of features, I, I think uh, sometimes those are found uh, characteristically on physical examination. And pediatricians haven't seen them. They'll actually see a callus on the arm of a child who may be self-biting. I actually asked to examine mother's arms right now because often the child will be doing some aggressive behavior against mom and you'll find scratching or uh, scarring or uh, damage to mom's arms as the marker for that child having aggression. Uh, and that may be my best physical marker of, of a problem going on. Certainly, we try very hard to do a good abdominal exam, and it's difficult in some children to get an abdominal exam. But if we can, often that may mark constipation by evidence of a mass or, or stool collection that we can get to by exam. I see. And can you speak to uh, or elaborate on what, what you just mentioned briefly, the immune or inflammation-mediated processes in the gut, what is actually known, and how strong is the evidence, and in what population groups of persons with autism that might pertain to? Well, it pertains uniquely to kids who are justified to undergo endoscopy. So these are kids where the providers have a strong sense that they are presenting with abdominal pain, and they are undergoing an endoscopy or colonoscopy, and there is more of a of an anecdotal or a pooling of the experience amongst those providers. And so in my practice, when we take those children to endoscopy or colonoscopy, we'll find a variety of inflammatory conditions such as uh, allergic esophagitis or acid reflux damage and, and reflux esophagitis. Some of the children that we'll investigate will have allergic changes throughout the gut or they'll have more diffuse inflammatory changes. Some of those children will have truly inflammatory bowel disease features, such as Crohn's disease or colitis. I, in my own practice, haven't been able to characterize a unique uh, clustering of these kids, but I think that we're, um, if, if biased, we're biased by the idea of particular behaviors that would prompt us to do a GI evaluation more than maybe other pediatric gastroenterology groups. I think that it's amazing as I go around the country and talk at other centers, many of the, of the GI groups will say, hey, we have this group of kids that have undergone endoscopy and we've found these findings. We're still trying to put together a reasonable pool of what those kids look like and what whether there is any pattern to their pathology. And in the medical literature on GI issues in persons with autism, when one thinks about the biology, there's an older literature about the possibility of altered GI permeability. Where do things stand with that type of pathophysiology? Yes, so currently? In increased intestinal permeability is also sort of given another name amongst the families, and that's leaky gut syndrome. And this idea of permeability of the, of the cells uh, or, the, or the junctions between cells might be a, a setting where you are able to bring across chemicals or other substances into the bloodstream that might somehow set off behaviors or problems with autism. Interestingly, the early literature talked about increased intestinal permeability often, and then it fell out of favor because doing permeability studies is pretty difficult in this population of kids. So to do an intestinal permeability study, you have to give them a couple, couple of poorly absorbable sugars and then measure their urine for several hours and then remeasure those sugars in the urine to see what got across the intestinal lining into the kidneys so that they could be measurable and you could compare that to other populations populations. The, the look at this permeability problem has come back into vogue at, at this point in time, and people are trying to find other ways to look at permeability. 
But the per classic permeability studies are still being looked at. And one of the problems with increased permeability is that if you've got a, a process going on in your gut, be it allergy or celiac or inflammatory conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, very often those conditions will cause changes in your intestinal permeability. But day by day and week by week, that permeability will vary. So we're not quite so sure how to place reliability on the testing that we're doing yet. And I think that's why you're not hearing a, a lot of discussion about what to do with that permeability problem now, because we don't know how to interpret the laboratory tests. I think we'll get better. And one of the things that's been looked at more recently is an intestinal marker called zonulin, which is abnormal in patients who've got permeability problems. And people are starting to look at that as a research tool to try to define these intestinal permeability problems a little bit more clearly. Is that a blood marker or a stool marker? It's a blood marker. I see. And you, you've talked about gluten sensitivity or intolerance. What other types of food intolerances have been described in persons with autism? Do any of them that do occur, uh, occur with greater frequency in autistic individuals relative to typically developing persons? And when and how should this be studied by a pediatrician or family practice staff? Yeah, this is a very difficult problem as well, because I think there are a variety of ways that foods can cause problems for individuals. And that's true in the general population as well as children with autism. So as we think about these problems as physicians, we try to break them down into ways that we can understand them. Food allergy is certainly a condition that we understand because we can do particular tests that might suggest a sensitivity that is a true immune reaction. And so when we talk about food allergy, we're talking about a child who gives a positive skin test or a positive antibody response to a food uh, by blood testing that suggests that they're intolerant to that product. A number of kids have food allergy uh, in the general pediatric population. We think that that frequency is somewhere around 5 to 8 percent in the general pediatric population. Recent reports looking at food allergy in children with autism continue to suggest that that frequency is somewhere around 20 to 25 percent in that population. So food allergy may be more common in children with autism, and it's certainly worth looking for. Part of the problem is that none of the allergy tests that we do routinely are perfect tests. And we know that even children who have peanut allergy, who may anaphylax from peanut allergy, may have negative skin testing and negative blood testing. So there's a small population of patients that we miss by doing standard allergy testing, and yet those children may be allergic to the food. So we can't rely on any of those tests as 100 percent reliability to answer that question. But at least we have certain things that we should sort of put on our radar screen that are consistent with allergy, such as skin reactions or respiratory reactions or immediate sensitivity reactions to particular intakes. That's one group of kids. Another group of kids may have a different type of sensitivity to the food that it's presented. And, and that could, that, that's a more uh, vague kind of dis discussion. Perhaps three-quarters of people who have gluten sensitivity don't have celiac or allergy to the gluten-type foods, but they have a clinical response to the withdrawal of those foods. And that clinical response may be improved sleep, less depression, less anxiety, as well as an improvement in gastrointestinal symptoms. And so this is a very hot topic in the general GI experience right now, because there are people who get better when they restrict gluten from the diet. And it is a sensitivity, but it's not an allergy that can be defined by a testing tool. We've got celiac disease and gluten in, in particular, which is a different type of immu an immune response. It's genetic. It runs in families. So we know how to look for that. And we've got very well-defined testing tools for that. And we've got a different type of digestion problem that happens in many kids, which is, is carbohydrate digestion or fat intolerance in some of those individuals. So if children don't digest fat well, or they've got a malabsorption type problem, the fat component of those foods might trigger gas or diarrhea or gastrointestinal distress. And lactose intolerance or other carbohydrate digestion problems often causes the same. And those problems may be gas, belly pain, distress, diarrhea, sometimes constipation. 
uh, from our own work, and we've published this in, in the journal Autism, among other places, uh, we find that lactose intolerance is extremely common in the population of children with autism who've got gastrointestinal issues who undergo workup. So in, in those kids, more than 60% of those children have evidence of lactose intolerance when we look for it. That's outrageously high and is, is a lot higher than the general population of lactose intolerant uh, patients. And it's even more common in those kids than the children who have gastrointestinal complaints who are presenting but do not have autism. That's interesting. Um, uh, Dr. Boo, you've provided us this wonderful overview of epidemiology and prevalence of major GI issues in persons with autism and the data that exists today supporting that and clinical insights into the recognition of different symptoms and signs for different types of GI pathologies. And you've given us um, an overview of what's known about the biology of different types of underlying GI pathologies in children with autism. Based upon your expertise and your years of work in the field, can you now provide us with an, a, a sense of where you feel are the greatest priorities for clinical research in the field of pediatric gastroenterology for persons with autism at this moment? I think one of the big pushes in the gastrointestinal experience is to try to define the microenvironment of the GI tract, and that is a very big topic right now on the research side. We have a, a data... What do you mean by microenvironment? So the intestinal microbiome is, is trying to look at the microflora that are living in the community of the GI tract. And there's a different microflora that's present in the stomach than is present in the small intestine, than is present in the colon. And those microenvironment changes may be accounting for some of the dysfunction that's going on in the GI tract for a variety of conditions. We are looking at those uh, disruptions in inflammatory bowel disease and in celiac disease, and we're starting to look at some disruptions that are happening in children with autism. And in the last five years in particular, there's a growing literature that's showing disruptions in the intestinal microflora that are starting to have patterns where particular bugs are deficient and particular bugs are predominating. And some of those predominating bugs may have byproducts that are getting to the brain or getting to the nervous system and accounting for neurological dysfunction. These are things that are extremely important to tease out, and we're just at the place where we're capable of looking at that with the science that's there in place. And so one of the ways that we're going to do that well is to start to develop biorepositories and good clinical databases of these children that we're collecting this information from so that we can really look at the differences in the presentation of those individuals and what we see in their microenvironment and this microbiota and the metabolic byproducts of that microbiota that may be accounting for what's going on in these individuals. Thanks very much for sharing your experience and your insights with us.